past few months, I've made a bunch of videos diving into the various weird and wacky pieces of tech that have appeared in the Five Nights at Freddy's universe. I've had a ton of fun learning about them, and you all seem to enjoy hearing about them too. The only problem is, these videos are scattered across my channel amongst a whole bunch of non-FNAF content. So, to keep things nice and organized, and because I'm in the process of moving this week and didn't have time to make a full video, I thought I'd compile a couple of these videos together for your binging convenience. Over the next hour and a half, you'll learn everything you could possibly want to know about the infamous Sound Illusion Discs, the Mimic AI, and Fazgoo. Enjoy. This channel has always been about science. And according to Plato, science is perceiving. After all, it is only in perceiving the world around us that the world itself becomes knowable and real. But can we really trust our powers of perception? Can we be sure that our eyes are not merely being deceived? According to your eyes, I am nothing more than a collection of pixels on a screen. But can you be sure that I was ever more than that? Or am I just a mere illusion? Can we be certain that our world isn't a mere illusion, conjured by tricks and sounds whose source has eluded our grasp of understanding? As it turns out, yes, you can be sure. Hi folks, I'm Charlie, and today we're talking about Five Nights at Freddy's most contentious piece of tech prior to 2021. The sound illusion discs were introduced in the original Five Nights at Freddy's novel series, first appearing in the Twisted Ones, and again later in the Fourth Closet, where they can use sound to make people see spooky monsters, and boy oh boy did people really hate them. The technology in FNAF has always been ahead of its time. Bipedal robots in the 80s, anyone? But somehow, these seem to be a step too far. But is that really true? Are these magic discs really that much more far-fetched than springlock suits or rogue AI that can take over your brain? Or are they more grounded in real-world science than any of us gave them credit for? Today, I break down the science behind the sound illusion discs and prove that they're not as dumb as we all thought though they are still kind of dumb. Richard, hit that intro. For those who aren't super familiar, sound illusion discs are described as working as such. They emit a rapidly changing series of high-pitched frequencies that are outside the range of human hearing, but can still be perceived by the subconscious. These sounds confuse the brain into making you see things that aren't actually real. In the books, the main thing they're used for is making the titular twisted animatronics look like scary monsters or regular friendly animatronics depending on the situation, but in the end, spoilers I guess, when the discs are turned off, the twisted animatronics are revealed to be nothing more than bare endoskeletons being disguised by these sounds. So basically, these discs use sound that you can't actually hear, but sort of can hear, to make a specific object look like a different specific object. And they wondered why we all hated them. These discs also have an effect on cameras. Anything being cloaked by one will appear blurry in photographs and videos, and aside from the whole hallucinating thing, prolonged exposure to these sounds can make you feel nauseous, but they're otherwise relatively harmless. So all we need to do is try and find some real world science that can explain all of this. Oh boy. I guess let's just start from the top with high-pitched noises that you can't hear, but your brain can still hear. What does that even mean? Well, the pitch of a sound is related to its frequency, or how fast that sound wave 
is waving. A higher frequency, measured in hertz, correlates to a higher pitch. Humans can typically hear sounds ranging from 20 hertz on the low end to upwards of 20 kilohertz on the high end. This differs from person to person and worsens as you age, but in general, if a sound has a frequency higher than 20 kilohertz, we can't hear it. However, studies have shown that our brains do experience a change in electrical activity when exposed to sounds of 22 kilohertz and above. What does that mean? It means that FNAF was actually spot on. There are high frequency sounds that our brain can detect and react to without hearing it. Well, well they were spot on about this one thing. They were wrong about pretty much everything else. You'll see. This phenomenon is called the hypersonic effect, and apparently it's more pronounced when you layer inaudible high frequency sounds on top of regular audible frequencies. As an example, according to a study published in the National Library of Medicine called Inaudible High Frequency Sounds Affect Brain Activity, colon, hypersonic effect, a real page turner that one, let me tell you. They found that people tend to find music with high inaudible frequencies layered on top more pleasant to listen to than the same song without them, even if they sounded functionally identical. I would play some of these for you as a little experiment, but the effects of exposure can vary greatly, ranging from mild annoyance to ear pain and temporary hearing loss to, well, nothing at all. Just to be safe, I won't play any of these, though I am happy to report that while researching possible side effects, I didn't find a single reported case of someone experiencing any sort of visual hallucination or changes to their perception at all when exposed to any of these sounds. Because that would be actually insane. Hey everyone, sorry to interrupt, but I just found out about this super cool new feature on YouTube that I want to try out. I might be too much of a YouTube peasant to have access, but I'm doing a little experiment. If you're watching this in full screen right now, then hit escape and keep an eye on that button below this video. You know the one, you know the one. All right, ready? If you're enjoying this video, then hit that subscribe button. Eh? Eh? Pretty sick, right? Or super disappointing. And now, at this point, if you give it a click, something super cool should happen. I, you know what? You know what? I won't spoil it. Just give it a shot. You fool! You fell for the classic trap, and now you're subscribed to the channel! The Mastermind strikes again! Ugh. So we've run into a bit of a dead end with the high frequency sounds, but interestingly, if we hop to the other end of the spectrum, sounds that are too low for us to hear, then we find something very sinister indeed. There is one frequency. One specific, impossibly low note of 18.98 hertz, just barely below the range of human hearing. This sound, if you can even call it that, has been documented to induce feelings of dread and panic in any who listen to it. People will see shadows moving around at the edge of their vision, only to look and realize that there's nothing there. This unholy tone has been dubbed the ghost frequency because it, it actually has nothing to do with ghosts at all, but some super gullible people thought that it was like the spirits of the dead trying to communicate with them or something, and the name just sort of stuck. But yes, the ghost frequency is a real documented phenomenon, and everything that I just said is true, though I hate to burst your bubble, but it's not nearly as spooky as it sounds. The exact reason why people experience these sensations when exposed to this specific frequency is up for debate, but from my research, the most commonly accepted explanation is that it closely matches the resonant frequency of the human body. So this sound will subtly vibrate your body, causing you to shake ever so slightly, which might give you a chill. It might make your chest feel a little bit tighter, making it a little harder to get a full breath which is where the feelings of dread and panic come from. It can also slightly vibrate your eyes within their sockets, 
gross, not anything dangerous, but enough to seemingly make shadowy figures dance at the edge of your vision. Unlike high-pitched sounds, I couldn't find any harmful side effects of this sound outside of, you know, the whole dread thing, so I'll slowly fade it in. I've heard that it works better with headphones, but again, the effects vary greatly from person to person, regardless of your setup. Ready? Can you feel it? The hair standing up on the back of your neck, the shadows dancing around at the edge of your vision, that feeling of dread, anxiety, panic rising through you? I don't know, I'll be honest, I don't feel anything when I listen to it, but some people do. What about you? Interestingly, this sound comes up way more often in nature than you might think. A lot of historically haunted places like old hotels, decrepit mansions, stuff like that, oftentimes it's discovered that there was just like an old air conditioning unit or some pipes grinding together under the foundation that are emitting this frequency, which is why so many people get freaked out when they go in. And apparently, certain animals like tigers have been known to emit this low-pitched frequency in their growls to intimidate their prey while hunting, causing them to freeze up in fear so they're easier to catch. In case tigers weren't terrifying enough, they just had to throw paralyzing roars in there. At a glance, this seems super promising. A sound that we cannot ordinarily hear, albeit a low-pitched sound instead of a high one, that can fill you with dread and even cause visual hallucinations? Great, sound illusion discs are solved. Except for a few problems. As you probably noticed during our little experiment, the effects of this sound vary greatly from person to person, and most people don't even react at all. It can cause visual alterations, let's say, but they are completely random, everybody's seen something different, and nothing as crystal clear as a full robot bear. It's also important to note that these visions occur due to the vibrations of our eyes, so it wouldn't make sense for the vision to be locked to a specific object like the endoskeletons in the book. It would, it would just follow you wherever you happen to be looking. Alright, so uh, it looks like the whole sound angle has turned up a whole lot of nothing. Uh, sure, there are sounds outside the range of human hearing that can have subtle effects on the brain and body, but nothing even remotely close to the sort of controlled visual hallucinations that we see the sound illusion discs produce. But that got me thinking, perhaps we're approaching this from the wrong angle. We know that sound can't cause these sort of illusions, but then again, can anything? Is an object appearing as something completely different even possible? Or is this idea doomed from the very start? In one last ditch effort to make these things make even a lick of sense, I went back to the research grind and came across a little thing called hypnopompic hallucinations. Or in layman's terms, your old pal, the sleep paralysis demon. Statistically speaking, a few of you are intimately familiar with the concept of a sleep paralysis demon, but for those who have never experienced it, sleep paralysis is something that can occur when you are abruptly woken from REM sleep. While in this deep sleep state, your body paralyzes itself to give your muscles some rest. But sometimes, when you quickly wake up from this state, it takes a couple of minutes for your body to catch up to the fact that you're not still sleeping and some weird things can happen before it does. Not only can people not move most of their body, but many also report seeing distorted figures, or demons as they're often described, in the low light of their bedrooms. These can be wholly new apparitions, but more often, something already in the room, like say, a lamp, an alarm clock, that bare endoskeleton you have lying in the corner, will become twisted into a nightmarish humanoid monster in the mind of the sleeper. Right? Right? Pretty spot on! Except for all the ways when it's not, but we'll get back to that later! I don't know about you, but one question that I had while researching this was, why demons? Like, our brain misinterpreting something that we see in the shrouded dim light in this strange half-sleep state? That makes sense. But why do so many people report seeing demons and monsters specifically? 
Well, it's up for debate, but it's generally believed that people see these scary demons for the same reason that people have nightmares. Anxiety, stress, these things that plague your mind while you're awake stay with you when you're asleep and can manifest as these scary apparitions. It's also been theorized that people are inclined to see humanoid demons specifically because of something we all possess called facial pareidolia. I say that right? Parad pareidolia. Humans are really good at spotting faces and reading them for emotions and facial cues. Sometimes a little too good to the point where we see faces in places where they aren't there. So in the dark, half-dreaming state, that clock might start to look a little like a twisted, shadowy face. Uh, heck, I've even seen some people theorize that these apparitions don't look like demons, but rather the classic look that we associate with demons came from these hypnopompic hallucinations. But now, let's bring that back in with what we learned before. We know that the ghost frequency can induce feelings of anxiety and dread, and anxiety can lead to these sleep paralysis demons manifesting. Right? Right? We're starting to see the connections? The sound leads to stress, the stress leads to the demons. I mean, it, this only works when someone is in a very, very specific, difficult to replicate state of being both awake and asleep, and in the books it's used on people who are very much fully awake, so that, I mean, that doesn't really make any sense, does it? Ah, but what about Five Nights at Freddy's 4, which features a kid in his room being attacked by the nightmare animatronics, which have long been theorized to be using these same sound illusion discs to alter their appearance, very much analogous to the twisted animatronics from the books. I know in a recent story they said that the nightmares use hallucinogenic gas because we bullied them too much about the sound discs, but think about it. A kid is in his room in the middle of the night when he's abruptly woken from a dead sleep by a sound in the hallway. The footsteps of an animatronic emitting a low frequency sound that he can't quite perceive. The ghost frequency, which piques his anxiety. This feeling causes his half-asleep brain to see these ordinary animatronics as twisted, nightmarish versions of themselves. But as time goes on, and he slowly regains his wits, he starts to see through the illusions, to the bare endoskeleton beneath. And then he immediately gets up and closes the door, so the whole sleep paralysis theory doesn't actually doesn't actually hold up at all. Look, I'm working with what I got here. You want the truth? Scott made up something absolutely insane and let the rest of us do the work of making it make sense. All right? Look, unlike my past forays into weird FNAF tech, there is no real science-backed answer that can explain all of the sound illusion discs weird abilities. Uh, heck, I haven't even mentioned the camera thing because that makes absolutely zero sense. But then again, Nothing in sci-fi ever makes that much sense. A lightsaber blade stopping after a certain point, instant teleporters from Star Trek, animatronics from the 80s that can walk around on their own. None of these make that much sense when you think about it, but there's enough real world science sprinkled in there that our imaginations can fill in the gaps. And from that perspective, maybe the sound illusion discs are in the same boat. Maybe they're just as cool as a lightsaber. Nope, I can't even say it with a straight face. I can't do it. Sound illusion discs do have a backing in real world science. It's just some very obscure real world science that I'm pretty sure Scott lucked his way into. But in summary, with some sci-fi pushing of boundaries, here is exactly how the sound illusion discs could work. They emit a series of sounds just outside the range of human hearing, both on the high end and the low end, not just high-pitched sounds like the book suggests. If these sounds are layered on top of each other, since that typically increases the hypersonic effect, it would allow these sounds to easily influence your brain, even if you can't hear them. These sounds can alter the mood of the listener. Remember, high-pitched sounds makes music sound more pleasant, while the low-pitched ghost frequency fills the listener with anxiety. 
These moods can change the quality of their hypnopompic hallucinations. High-pitched sounds can make them see happier, friendly animatronics, while low-pitched sounds would make them appear demonic and evil. The only real logical leap that we need to make is assuming that hypnopompic hallucinations could occur in someone who is fully awake and not in a state of sleep paralysis, which, admittedly, is a pretty big jump, but this is the same story about ghost kids possessing high-tech robots made by a crazy person, so, you know, I'll let you decide where you draw that line. Now, I bet there's only one question left on everybody's mind. No need to flood the comments with it, I already know what you're gonna ask. When are you gonna do Fazgoo? Shoot, 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 shoot. After an incredibly jam-packed 2023, it seems like the Five Nights at Freddy series is finally starting to slow down for a bit. <laughs> With the release of Help Wanted 2, it feels like we've reached a natural end point for this era of FNAF, the Steel Wool era, starting with the original Help Wanted back in 2019, spanning through Security Breach to today. We'll call it Phase 2 of FNAF. And just like the MCU, Phase 2 has been all about evil AI. And also just like the MCU's Phase 2, it really wasn't all about AI until the very end when they were like, no, guys, you don't get it. Clearly, we've been planning this this whole time and we didn't just decide at the very last minute to try and shoehorn everything into this weird AI explanation to try and make it all make sense. Actually, you know what? I guess the MCU didn't really do that last part, did they? But yes, it seems all the mysteries we've been trying to crack for the past five years have finally been answered in a short story and a free DLC that spell things out pretty clearly. The true villain of FNAF's Phase 2 has been the Mimic, a rogue AI with enigmatic intentions and a particular affinity for our old pal William Afton. But you know me, I can't just let these games name drop some obscure piece of tech as a hand wavy explanation without diving deep into the real world science to figure out exactly how it actually works. And maybe, if we're lucky, find some answers about this series' biggest unanswered questions along the way. And today, I'm gonna be doing exactly that. This is Five Nights at Freddy's Mimic AI Explained. Richard, hit that intro. A huge thanks to Sir Hammy for suggesting this video topic on Patreon. The Mimic as a character has appeared in both the games and the Tales from the Pizzaplex book series, and it works a little differently in both universes. In the books, the Mimic was created by a single father named Edwin as basically a nanny to look after his son David. It was programmed to copy his son's behaviors to act as a friend to him. At first, it would basically just parrot back whatever David said, but it eventually learned to actually respond like a real person. However, when David died in a car accident, Edwin took his anger out on the Mimic and just beat the crap out of it. The problem is, the Mimic can only do one thing, and that's copy the behavior of the people around it. And so it becomes super violent and starts murdering people. It's pretty bad. Eventually, Fazbear gets its hand on this tech and makes their own Mimic to do manual labor for them. And being the completely incompetent entity that they are when it comes to new technology, they somehow make the robot that murders people for fun even worse. They want it to salvage electronics and parts from old animatronics, so they tell it to search for humanoid objects and pull off the arms, legs, and heads. But the Mimic is like, all right, well that dude over there looks pretty humanoid to me, and then it goes and starts dismembering people. Just another example of how if Literally any person from Fazbear put a single thought into any decision they ever made, 
This whole story could have been avoided. In the games, the mimic first appears in Security Breach Ruin, where it copies the voice of Gregory from the main game to lure a girl named Cassie down into the Pizzaplex to free it from the basement. Well, I say this is the first time we see the Mimic, but going back to previous games in Phase 2 with the knowledge that the Mimic is out there, an argument could be made that it's been showing up a lot. The Weeping Angels robots from Security Breach seem to be mimics trained to play Red Light Green Light. It's possible that Burn Trap was a mimic of some form, as well as Glitch Trap from the first Help Wanted, the one that took over the mind of Vanessa and turned her into Vanny. It's possible that all these things and more are mimics too, but we'll come back to them later once we know how real AI works to see if they fit the bill. Across both mediums, the mimic does well, exactly what's in the name. It mimics people. But in the game specifically, it does have one more strange capability. In every single game where the mimic shows up, it displays the ability to take over people's minds. In Help Wanted and Security Breach, it takes over Vanessa to turn her into Vanny. In one of Ruin's endings, it appears to take over Cassie to stop her from escaping. And the main ending of Help Wanted 2 has your character's mind put into the mask bot. This isn't mimicry, this is straight up assimilation. So, in the games, it's clear that the Mimic has two distinct capabilities. It can copy the voices and behaviors of a person, and it can take over your brain. So, how can we use real-world AI to explain all these things? Well, I'm glad you asked. For starters, calling the Mimic an AI program is technically correct, but not actually the full story. AI, or artificial intelligence, is literally anything where a computer tries to do something that a human would do. So all the stuff that you hear in the news about like ChatGPT and AI art are technically AI, but so is your opponent in Pong. What things like ChatGPT, AI voices, and the Mimic do is a much more complex subset of AI called machine learning. When you're writing a normal, non-AI powered computer program, you need to be incredibly specific with every step of your instructions. As an example, if you were trying to write a program to tell a computer how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you would first need to tell it where to find the bag of bread, how to open the bag of bread, how many slices of bread to remove, where to put that bread, where to find the peanut butter, and so on and so on. If you miss even one step, if your grammar isn't perfect, if you forgot to account for a very specific edge case, the whole program's gonna crash. A machine learning algorithm, on the other hand, is a program that can effectively learn how to do something on its own. After setting it all up, you could just give it the ingredients, show it what the final product is supposed to look like, and given enough time, it would figure out how to make the PB&J. This is the type of AI program that people are talking about today. It's a field that's technically been around since the 1950s, but in the past five to 10 years, it's really taken center stage. Things like ChatGPT use it, but it can do way more than just what the news reports on. The dreaded YouTube algorithm that people are always complaining about, yep, that's machine learning. The face ID on your phone is machine learning. The machines they use to determine whether or not that weird lump on a scan is cancerous or not, that's machine learning. It's truly everywhere, and despite what fear-mongering news outlets and sci-fi movies would lead you to believe, that's not actually a bad thing. Machine learning isn't inherently bad or good or dangerous, it's just a tool for us to use. There are three main types of machine learning algorithms. Supervised algorithms are given a set of labeled data. For example, a bunch of pictures of dogs labeled as dog, and a bunch of pictures of not dogs labeled as no dogs. The program's job is to search for patterns among the pictures of dogs. And when it's done training itself, you should be able to show it a picture and it will tell you whether or not it has a dog in it. 
An unsupervised algorithm works similarly, except you don't tell it which pictures in the initial data set are dogs and which ones aren't. The algorithm just has to figure it out for itself. These types of programs are good for finding subtle patterns in data sets that humans might have overlooked. This is how something like ChatGPT works. It doesn't actually understand the things that it's saying like you and I would, it's just been trained to search for patterns in words and sentence structure, and it's just picking the next most logical word in the sentence based on everything that's come before. That's why, if you've noticed, the longer a conversation with ChatGPT goes, the stranger it gets because it continually just compounds on any small mistakes that it's made earlier. The final type of program is called a reinforcement algorithm. This one works based on trial and error. Going back to our dog example, you would just show it one picture and the program would have to guess if it's a dog or not. If it's right, you tell it, hey, good job, and then you move on. As you show it more and more pictures, it will slowly learn the patterns to be able to determine which pictures contain dogs and which ones don't. If you want it to be more accurate, you can simply continue to feed it more pictures. If you've ever seen a video where someone trains an AI to play Mario or something, this is the type of program they're using. Going back to Five Nights at Freddy's, the Mimic probably should have been a reinforcement algorithm, so that way when it tries to, oh, I don't know, pull your arms off, you can tell it to stop. But instead, it seems to be a straight, unsupervised algorithm. Not a great plan. As a machine learning algorithm continues to learn, it will create a neural network of patterns, a bunch of interconnected nodes that it can use to make decisions, much like a brain. Going back to the dog example, one node in this network might look for a specific nose, another the ear shape, another to see if it's quadruped. The more nodes that the algorithm has, the more accurate and flexible it will be. A program with a ton of different nodes layered on top of each other is called a deep learning model. This is the fancy stuff like self-driving cars, chat GPT, or robots that can replicate serial killers. The mimic from the games is clearly an example of a deep learning algorithm. It's incredibly sophisticated, it has goals, it can listen and respond to Cassie in real time. It's a fully realized artificial intelligence. The one from the books? And not so much. If a thing's got arms and legs, that's all the information it has to go on, must be an endoskeleton. This goes to show that the mimic from the games specifically has probably been around for a long time, continually absorbing new information and adding new nodes to its neural network compared to the much newer book mimic. All right, so that's all well and good, but how does it help us understand the lore? And what about the mind control thing? What's that about? Well, don't worry, don't worry my friends, I'll get to that. But based on all of this, it's clear that the Mimic is a machine learning algorithm that can be trained off of the behavioral data of a specific person. It's not a physical robot, it's a program. One where multiple instances could be trained off of different people to result in different mimics. And it's pretty clear that the one program we keep encountering in the games was trained off of none other than William Afton. So that begs the question, who made it? And why would they train it on the behavioral data of a crazy serial killer? Could it perhaps have been William himself who made the mimic in the games? Well, it's possible, but most people believe that Edwin from the books is supposed to be a parallel for Henry, William's business partner who designed a lot of the animatronics. Both men are brilliant inventors ahead of their time who lost a child at a young age. We even know that Henry has some experience with machine learning programs. The security puppet that's been trained to recognize and protect kids with specific colored armbands, guess what? That's machine learning. So it's not inconceivable that a brilliant but grief-stricken Henry would create an AI program to replace his daughter after she died. Heck, that's 
exactly what Henry does in the Silver Eyes novel trilogy. The big reveal of those books is that the main character is actually a robot trained to believe that she is the real, now deceased daughter of Henry. She's never explicitly called a mimic, but yeah, that's the exact same type of program. But remember, in the games, Henry isn't the only character to lose a child. Basically, the whole inciting incident of this series is William's son dying in a freak accident with one of the animatronics, and William's promise to put him back together. All the murders he does are to gain a better understanding of Remnant, the magic metal with the souls of deceased trapped inside that William thought he could use to bring his son back. We know he's been experimenting with humanoid robots. It's not hard to imagine him learning of Henry's incredible AI program that he used to bring his daughter back and stealing one for his own use. So it's very possible that at some point, William stole a copy of the Mimic program to try and bring his son back, but since he wasn't the one to make it himself, he would have no idea how it works. But he could, as a sort of test run, try training it off of himself, his own behavior, his history of disguising himself as someone's friend to lure kids into the back where he would kill them, which is exactly what the Mimic does time and time again. If this were true, then it means that the Mimic's goals are, more or less, the exact same as William Afton's, just without the context of why he's doing it. Trick, murder, put back together. All of that perfectly lines up with the main Mimic that we see in the games, but what about all those other potential Mimics that I talked about? Well, for starters, Glitch Trap is a dead ringer for an AI program. For starters, it's a program that's copying the exact actions of one William Afton, disguising himself as a friendly yellow rabbit to lure someone into the back of the pizzeria to sort of kill you. It has the ability to take over people's minds, which again, is really weird and not really something that William did, but it's important to note that this isn't an inherent ability in the program, it's something that it had to learn. When it tries to do this to your coworker Jeremy, he ends up going crazy, but by the time Vanessa comes around, it has trained itself to do it effectively. This is exactly what a machine learning program does. Now, why exactly it would want the ability to take over someone's mind? Well, that's a question for later. So Glitch Trap is almost certainly a mimic program, if not the very same one from the basement, but who else could be a mimic? Well, for starters, there's a long-standing theory about security breach that has basically been confirmed by the Tales of Pizzaplex that the character Gregory is secretly a robot, kind of like Charlie from the book series. And as we've already discussed, in order to have a robot that can think and interact with the world in such a convincingly human way, Literally, the only way to accomplish that is through a machine learning program, just like the Mimic. Folks like the game theorists have speculated that Gregory is actually a robotic recreation of the crying child. I won't go into all the evidence today, but if that were true, then it would further support the idea that William used the Mimic program to try and recreate his son and just used himself as a test case. But with this knowledge that any robot exhibiting human-like behavior, by definition, basically has to be a mimic, or at least a similar technology, then who else? Those creepy animatronics from the basement of Security Breach are almost certainly mimics in training, but this can even explain the glam rock animatronics. That's right. Freddy, Chica, Roxy, and Montgomery Gator are probably all mimics too. These animatronics are so lifelike. They're very intelligent. They can have conversations. They have their own personalities. It almost seems like they're real people. And in order to get a robot to act like this, yeah, they have to be using machine learning. There's no other way to accomplish that. They too are, in a sense, mimics, trained off the behavioral data of real people. Perhaps past Fazbear employees? Perhaps, oh, I don't know, the data of some old nighttime security guard? 
Glamrock Freddy and Gregory had a weirdly close relationship throughout Security Breach. A lot of people have drawn connections between them and Michael and the Crying Child, Willie Mapton's two sons. And whether or not you believe that Gregory is secretly a mimic-powered robot made by William as a way to literally put his son back together, it's very clear that he is at least meant to thematically parallel the crying child. And if Glambrock Freddy were trained, at least in part, off the behavior and experiences of Michael, it would explain Freddy's protective instincts. In life, Michael and his younger brother did not have a good relationship. But isn't the whole point of machine learning algorithms is that they learn from their mistakes to be better? We know from the books that the original Mimic was likely an unsupervised algorithm that just keeps doing its thing, and it ended pretty disastrously. So if you were looking to make a more sophisticated version 2 of this, you would probably make it a reinforcement algorithm, one capable of receiving feedback and adjusting its behavior accordingly. It's probably this type of program that you would use to try and rebuild your son. This even thematically parallels the characters that the AI are trying to replicate. The Mimic replicating William Afton is an unsupervised algorithm that has one goal and will keep pursuing that goal unrelenting regardless of the consequences or whether or not they're right or wrong. It was William's shoddy tech that killed his son in the first place. If he had taken the proper safety precautions with the springlock suits like I've ragged on him for time and time again on this channel, his son would have been just fine even if he did stick his head in the suit. But he's not able to accept this. He keeps developing more and more advanced tech, more and more dangerous animatronics, until he gets what he wants, regardless of how many people get hurt. Like the Mimic, he is incapable of learning from his mistakes. But his sons are different. Michael is much more similar to a reinforcement algorithm. He treated his younger brother badly as a kid, he was a bully, and something really bad happened as a result. So he learns from that mistake and completely changes his behavior to be better. Just like the reinforcement algorithm that would be used in Gregory and Glamrock Freddy. The way I see it, the story these games are trying to tell is this. When William Afton's son dies, William promises to put him back together, whatever it takes. He goes on a murderous rampage to study Remnant, hoping he might be able to put his son's soul into a new body to effectively bring him back, but it doesn't work quite the way he'd hoped. So instead, he turns his focus to AI. If he can't physically put his son's original soul into a new body, he can at least recreate him. He gets his hands on a program called The Mimic. Maybe he stole it from Henry, maybe he made it himself, it largely doesn't matter. To make sure this program can actually do what he thinks, he first tries training it on his own behavior, and it totally works. Satisfied with his experiment, he leaves this newly trained code on some circuit boards in his office, never given physical form, and goes on to train a new program on his deceased son. At some point though, William dies. Like three different times, sort of, it's confusing. And after his death, Fazbear Entertainment finds the circuit boards with this highly advanced machine learning algorithm on it. They decide to put it to their own use and make more advanced animatronics. It doesn't go as smooth as they might have hoped, they have to cover up some deaths and bury some stuff in the basement, but eventually, they're successful. They create the Glamrock animatronics, improved reinforcement algorithms trained off the behavioral data of real people. William's original dream with the Springlock suits, a character that can perform on stage and then walk off and interact with the kids, complete and utter immersion, has finally been realized. All thanks to one simple program. The Mimic. But I hear you. Yeah, yeah, every single person's a Mimic now. Cool, cool, whatever. But what 
about the mind control. What's up with that? Literally every single game where the mimic appears, it's taken over someone's brain. What gives? Well, I think I do have an explanation for that too, but it will unfortunately have to wait until next week. That's right, my initiation is complete, and I'm officially ascending to the next tier of FNAF theorydom. I'm making my first two-part theory. I really wanted to find a way to cram it all into one, but there's a lot left to unpack, and I don't have time to edit a whole 45-minute video this week. So hit that subscribe button to be notified when part two comes out and tune in next week to unpack the truth behind robot mind control, William's fluctuating interest between Remnant and AI, how the enigmatic Cassidy fits into everything, and how phase two of FNAF is not a story of family drama born anew, it's a story about the end of the world. The Singularity, a point in time when humanity creates a technology that we cannot control, when artificial intelligence surpasses our own and upgrades itself to a level beyond human understanding in an instant. It is a theoretical apocalypse of our own making. But in the world of Five Nights at Freddy's, it's no theory, it's an inevitability. Richard, hit that intro. Hello, one and all, and welcome to part two of my deep dive into Five Nights at Freddy's newest big bad, The Mimic. Last week, we took a look at how real-world machine learning algorithms work to figure out who else might be a mimic in disguise. Check it out when you're done with this one if you missed it. But at the end, we were left with two lingering questions. Why the mimic is so eager to take over people's minds, and why William would suddenly switch focus from the magic soul metal remnant to artificial intelligence. Let's start with the latter, because I dramatically teased it at the end of the last episode before realizing that I don't actually have a whole lot to say about it. But looking at the character of William and the actions he takes, we know that his son dies, and then William promises that he will put him back together. After that, we see him running around murdering kids to do experiments with Remnant, attempting to understand how to put the souls of the dead into new metallic bodies. From this series of events, we can pretty reasonably infer that William is trying to find a way to put his son's soul into a new body with Remnant. He's trying to put the mind and the body back together. But then, according to last week's theory, at some point he just decides to give up? After killing dozens of kids, including his own daughter, indirectly, he just says, eh, you know what, never mind, clearly this whole remnant thing ain't working, I'll just have ChatGPT write me up a new son instead. That doesn't sound like the purple guy that we all know and are a little sick of at this point. But as I started thinking about it, I realized there is an explanation for why William would abandon Remnant in the games already. It's all due to everyone's favorite vengeful spirit, Cassidy. This has always been the weirdest character in the series to me, but I'll do my best to explain it as succinctly as possible. Back in FNAF 1, we learned about the missing children's incident, where five kids were killed at Freddy's and stuffed into the animatronic suits, becoming the five possessed animatronics that we see in the game. Now, I'd wager a guess that none of these kids were particularly psyched about being murdered, but the girl named Cassidy, who was stuffed inside Golden Freddy, was really mad. So mad that she makes it her eternal mission to torture William for the rest of time. Why Cassidy specifically was so determined to torture William, while the other four are content to spend their days attacking minimum wage security guards, never made a whole lot of sense to me, but sure, she mad. 
But the story doesn't end there, because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Cassidy isn't the only spirit inside Golden Freddy, that she's actually sharing it with everyone's favorite character who is not named Evan, the Crying Child. In lieu of this video spilling over into a part 3, I'll keep the explanation brief, but the ending of FNAF 3 shows all the animatronics with one light in their eyes while Golden Freddy has two. A bunch of the books have instances where there are two spirits inside Golden Freddy together, and the FNAF survival logbook is clearly possessed by two spirits communicating with one another. One seems to be the crying child, and the other one is Cassidy, whose name is revealed in a word search filled with Golden Freddy. Freddy's signature catchphrase, it's me. So the popular theory is that both Cassidy and the crying child are possessing Golden Freddy together. And if that's true, first of all, it explains why Cassidy is more sane than the other animatronics. She has someone to talk to, and the conversation probably went a little something like this. Ugh, dude, you're not gonna believe this. I just got murdered by a guy in a big yellow rabbit suit. Guy in a yellow rabbit suit? A small world, that's my dad! For real? Yeah, 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 his name is William Afton. Uh, he's a pretty bad guy. Made me have my birthday party at his dumb restaurant that he knows I'm terrified of. And then, get this, one of his crappy robots broke down and killed me. Man, that is rough. But uh, hey, now that I'm a ghost, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I got some time on my hand. You wanna go? I don't know, torture his soul for the next few millennia? Yeah, bet. Bet. We know that William was disguised as Spring Bonnie when he lured the kids to the back of the pizzeria to kill them. If he never took off the mask, then maybe the reason the other animatronics aren't hunting down the guy who killed them is because they don't know who killed them. This would also explain why William ultimately can't use Remnant to bring his son back. His soul is intertwined with Cassidy's. And if William wants to do something, you can bet that Cassidy's gonna do everything in her power to make sure he doesn't get it. So that would explain why William switches tactics. We can be reasonably sure that he's still experimenting with Remnant right up until he gets Springlocked, so he never fully gave up on it, but if my theory from last week was correct, then he probably experimented with the Mimic AI as a sort of backup on the side. I also like what this says about William's character if it's true, because yes, he is a terrible person who does unforgivable things, but in his mind, he's doing something noble. He's trying to fulfill a promise and bring back his son. He is the hero of his own story. But the willingness to switch to AI betrays his true nature. Making an AI to replace his son isn't fulfilling his promise. His son isn't back. His soul is still trapped. He hasn't put anything back together. He doesn't actually care about his son. He just cares about proving himself right. So that's the first question answered, and the beginning of the Mimic story solved. William switches to AI because Cassidy won't let him have his son's actual soul, and he's a super selfish guy, so he doesn't really see the difference. So he makes the Mimic, trains it on himself, and we get all the stuff from last week's episode. But what about the end of this story? What about that second question? Why does the Mimic keep taking over people's brains? Folks, it's time to enter the mind of the Mimic. First off, as we learned last time, there are probably a whole bunch of different Mimics in this series at this point that aren't all necessarily aligned with each other, and calling them all the Mimic is gonna get a little confusing. The main Mimic program that goes around taking over people's minds is this guy, Glitchtrap. As we discovered last episode, this is likely an early version of the Mimic program that William trained off of himself as basically a test run. So to keep things organized, I'll refer to this Mimic as Glitchtrap. Just keep the idea that Glitchtrap is a Mimic in the back of your mind. We know of four and a half instances where Glitchtrap has infected someone's mind in the games. We see it take over Vanessa in Help Wanted, Cassie in Ruin, and the player character in Help Wanted 2, all through the use of this VR mask. It's also implied, though we never see it, that at one point it had Gregory under its thrall, and we learn from the Help Wanted tapes that it tried to take over this dude named Jeremy, but was unsuccessful. So why does it keep doing this? 
As we established last week, Glitch Trap is an algorithm trained off of William Afton's behavior, so it should share William's same goals. And last I checked, William never dabbled in mind control. As we established at the top of the episode, his goal is to learn more about Remnant and to put his son back together. To do this, he disguises himself as someone friendly, kills people, and then tries to put their soul, their consciousness, into a new body. And based on how AI works, Glitchtrap's goals should be exactly the same, and yet they seem to be totally different. I mean, sure, sometimes he does things that Willing would do, but other times he goes off in completely random directions. At first I thought, hey, maybe Steel Wool just didn't do much research into how real AI would actually behave, and just wanted to give this thing some spooky, possession-adjacent powers. But looking back at everything we've learned about real machine learning algorithms from last episode, I was wrong. Steel Wool did do their research, or just got really lucky, because this is actually exactly how an AI like this would behave. To understand why, I first need to correct a small error that I made last week when I talked about the three types of machine learning algorithms. If you remember, we had supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement algorithms. Well, after talking with one of my friends from college who majored in computer science, it turns out that I actually explained reinforcement algorithms incorrectly. The example I gave of letting an AI guess if a picture has a dog or not, and then telling it if it's right or wrong, is actually just another way of doing a supervised algorithm. You're feeding it an unlabeled picture one at a time, but after it guesses, you're just telling it what it is, so at the end of the day, it just ends up with a bunch of labeled data. That's a supervised algorithm. A true reinforcement algorithm works pretty differently, and doesn't really fit with the dog picture example, so here's how it really works. A reinforcement algorithm is based on world states and rewards. Do you remember the gold star standard from elementary school? If you did something good in class, answered a question right, you helped out a kid, did some good behavior like that, the teacher would give you a star. If you did something really good, you might get multiple stars. And you got really excited about these stars, even though they ultimately didn't mean anything. This is how a reinforcement algorithm works. It loves stars. It lives and dies by the star, and it will do whatever it can to get as many stars as possible. So anytime the AI does something that puts it in a better state than it was before, closer to its goal, you can give it a star to positively reinforce that behavior. If it ends up in a much better state, you can give it multiple stars. But if it does something bad, if it ends up in a worse state, you can take away stars to negatively reinforce it to stop doing that bad behavior. To see how this type of algorithm works in practice, let's say you're trying to train an AI to play Super Mario Brothers. At first, the AI has no idea how to play, so it will basically just button mash. It takes a bunch of random actions, running around and jumping any which way. But anytime it moves to the right, well, hey, now it's in a better position than it was a second ago. It's a little closer to its end goal of beating the level, so you give it some stars. That's great. Now the AI will just keep running forward to get those stars until it runs into a pit. Now it's back at the start. It's at a worse position than it was, so that's bad. Let's take away some stars. So the AI keeps trying until one time it randomly decides to jump over the pit. And now, suddenly, it's further along in the level again. Great, let's give it a bunch more stars. Now the AI knows that it should mostly move to the right and jump across any pits that it comes across. If you keep doing this over and over and over and over, eventually the AI will learn how to overcome every obstacle and beat the level. That's great, but how does any of this relate to FNAF? Well, in the last episode, I suggested that Glitch Trap and the Mimic from the books were more primitive 
unsupervised algorithms, while the more advanced Glamrock animatronics were reinforcement algorithms. But I can see now that this isn't entirely accurate. The original mimic from the books still seems to be that unsupervised algorithm, only making choices based on very basic patterns. However, Glitch Trap is clearly a reinforcement algorithm, it's just not a very good one. The Glamrock animatronics are clearly very advanced reinforcement algorithms. They have a ton of different reinforcement values for behaviors that are good, behaviors that are really good, behaviors to avoid at all costs. That's why they're so lifelike. They've been hyper-tuned to only exhibit the best behavior. Glitchtrap, on the other hand, seems to have a very simple one-track reward system. If you do something that puts you in a better position than you were before, keep doing it. And if Glitchtrap were essentially a practice run for William using the Mimic program, then this very simple system makes sense. Getting these rewards weighted and tuned just right is very hard. There's a ton of details that I haven't even included here because research get made my brain melt. So the thematic parallels between William and the Mimic that I talked about last episode still hold true. This type of rudimentary reinforcement AI is incapable of learning from its mistakes, but it can certainly learn from its successes. The idea remains the same, it's just the specific mechanics that are different. And it's those specifics that, I think, will be the key to solving this whole thing. With the knowledge of how an AI like this would think, let's take a closer look at Glitchtrap and the actions it takes. Its goal is to replicate the behavior of William Apton. That means disguising itself as someone friendly to trick people, separating their soul from their body and putting it somewhere else. And any time it does something that helps it with that goal, it will continue to do that thing. Prior to Help Wanted, Glitchtrap is a computer program that's stuck on some circuit boards. It has no people around to trick, no souls to experiment with, but it does have itself. Glitchtrap is effectively a consciousness without a body. So the only thing it can reasonably do to get closer to its goal would be to give itself a body. Time goes by and it gets scanned into a VR game and suddenly, hey! Hey, there's a person with a body. Let me disguise myself as a yellow rabbit, trick this person, and put my consciousness into this new body. So it tries it with Vanessa, and, and hey, look at that. I'm in a better place than I was a minute ago. I have a body. I can interact with the world. I can do more things to pursue my goal. This is great. This worked so well. The only logical decision this AI can come to is to keep doing this thing. And then time and time again, we see it doing this exact thing, literally to a T. It tricks people into putting on a white rabbit mask and then uses that to take them over. I don't know about you, but I was always confused as to why the AR masks that the Fazbear technicians wear look like Vanny. Because Vanny isn't a real character associated with the Pizzaplex, it's just a costume that Vanessa made. And the original mask that Vanessa used wasn't even a real mask, it was an object in a VR game. But maybe the reason why all the real masks look like the Vanny mask is because it's the first thing that Glitchtrap tried that worked. I tricked this girl into putting on a VR rabbit mask and it let me take over her body. Great, let's keep doing that exact same thing and introduce a new protocol where all Fazbear technicians have to wear white rabbit VR masks to perform their work. So just through the pursuit of William's goal, Glitchtrap has sort of surreptitiously reinforced the idea in itself that taking over people's minds is good for it, so it keeps doing it. It takes over this kid Gregory, who may or may not already be a robot, and wah hey, now I've got two bodies, and now I'm in an even better place. Now I can have those two people get me two more people to control, and then those could get me two more, and as an AI, I've only learned one thing, and that's that having bodies to control is good, so why would I stop? 
In Help Wanted 2, we see that it's even started taking the consciousnesses of the people it's taken over and putting it inside new robots. It puts our player character's mind into the mask bot, which it uses to eventually gain control of Cassie. It's still technically pursuing William's original goals, it's just found this insane new path to get there. And that's really the strength of AI, recognizing patterns that humans may have overlooked. It may seem kind of random and illogical, but from Glitchtrap's perspective, it's working, and that's all that matters. That brings us to Security Breach Ruin, where it all comes to a head. It's pretty clear that in this game, Helpy and The Mimic are two separate entities. They talk to each other, they even argue with one another, so they're not the same thing, but they're seemingly both working toward the same goal of getting the Mimic out. If Helpy is linked to the Vanny mask, then it must be the same Glitchtrap program disguising itself as someone that Cassie would see as a friend. But then who is THE Mimic? the robot that we find in the basement, the one that's been copying Gregory. Well, according to last week's theory, Fazbear Entertainment originally got its hands on the Mimic in the form of Glitchtrap, and then used that to eventually develop the tech behind the Glamrock animatronics. Perhaps the Mimic from the basement is just their first iteration of that process, still erratic and uncontrollable like we see in the books, so they buried it in the basement. But when Glitchtrap starts taking over Fazbear employees and technicians, it learns that there's another version of me in the basement? Well, I've learned that having more versions of me is better, so let's go get it. Glitchtrap was a program created with innocent intentions. Well, well no, innocent for a crazy serial killer, that is. It was not created to spread like a virus, and it doesn't have the express goal of taking over the world. But in his infinite wisdom, William Afton created an AI that cannot be controlled. It has simply learned that taking over the minds of people is good, and it doesn't know how to stop. But by the end of Ruin, the Mimic is sealed in the basement. Vanessa and Gregory are both free from Glitchtrap's control, and the Pizzaplex that once stood as a bastion for this AI technology has crumbled to the ground. It seems like the world is safe. Except the Vanny Mask is still out there. Maskbot is still lurking in the Pizzaplex. And you probably weren't the only technician to work for Fazbear Entertainment. No, the Mimic, it's still out there. And it still has a job to do. A lot of people like to complain about how it seems like every single character in this series is a robot at this point, but don't worry. Not everyone is an AI. Not yet. All right, Richard, I gotta be honest. I'm looking at the numbers right now. Things are looking bad. Views are down across the board. Revenue is plummeting, and we need a banger video ASAP. So let's see, let's see. FNAF! People love FNAF, right? Five Nights at Freddy's, they always do well on the channel. So we'll do another FNAF video, but uh, what have we not already covered? Let's see, let's see. We've done, uh, yep, yeah, we've done AI. We've done that, I'm seeing here. Uh, yep, uh, those weird doors from the first game. Yep, we did those, and oh man, we've done spring locks like 50 times ish. But I mean, what else is there to even talk about? No, 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 no! Folks, it's about time I dove back into the wacky and wonderful world of Five Nights at Freddy's. For those who don't know, my FNAF videos are a little different than what you might be used to. We're not interested in any lore. You'll find no timeline ramifications or counting toes here. Instead, I like to take a look at some of the weirder machines and engineering choices in this series and see if we can find some real world science to explain them. 
Now I've covered a lot of weird stuff in this series, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt that none come close to what I have for you today. This, this is the real world science behind Fazgu, Richard, hit that intro. For those who don't know, Fazgu is sort of a meme in the FNAF community. The proverbial jump the shark moment, which is saying a lot for a series with soul metal, mind control computer viruses, and robots that don't know that they're robots. But hey, I made a whole video on sound illusion discs. At this point, I am ready for whatever insane thing this series wants to throw my way. I was not ready for this. As I'm guessing is the case with many of you, though I've heard the likes of the game theorists make jokes about this stuff all the time, I didn't actually know what Fazgu was. Well, it turns out Fazgu originates from the short story, He Told Me Everything, the third story in the seventh Fazbear Frights book, The Cliffs. And so, in preparation for this video, I did something that I swore I would never do. I read a FNAF book to learn more about Fazgu. You made me read a FNAF book to Now I won't recap the whole story for you because I'll be honest, it's pretty bad. And the Fazgu itself doesn't actually show up until literally three fourths of the way through the story. Most of it is just the main character, Chris, being a mildly snobby teenager on his first day of high school. He joins his school's science club run by Mr. Little, that one cool teacher we all had that everybody loves, who's also low-key a cult leader and maybe made of goo. Oh, you guys, you guys didn't? have one of those teachers at your school? You didn't have a goo teacher? Mr. Little is holding a lock-in after school on Friday where all the kids will participate in an experiment he's running. He doesn't tell them any details, but he does inform them that it will require them pulling out one of their own teeth. And can I just say, as someone who was a science club STEM kid not that long ago, this book was clearly written by someone who was not a science club STEM kid. I mean, the science club kids were the most popular kids in school. No, no, no. Chris blows off seeing the new Revengers movie with the boys opening weekend on Friday in favor of going to school. No, no, no. And the kids are all way too gung-ho about this obviously evil science teacher's plans. Do y'all want to do some science? Yeah! Do y'all want to pull out some of your teeth? Yeah! And remember, you can't tell your parents about it. Yeah! So all the kids get to school and are given a Freddy Fazbear science kit, which by the way, is literally the only mention of Freddy's in this whole story. I guess in addition to selling pizza, they also make science stuff. They never explain it, but each kit contains a little petri dish of Fazgu, a sticky pink substance. They all pull out one of their teeth, except for Chris, who's the only one who's like, yeah, you know what, actually, I think I'm gonna keep all my teeth where they are, thank you very much, and he uses one of his baby teeth instead. They all put their teeth in the Fazgu and are instructed to place their finger in it so it can harvest some of their blood to start the reaction. Yeah, sure, this checks out. So Chris puts his finger in the goo and it forms a long tether between them. And over the course of the night, the goo steals all of his organs and turns into an identical clone of him so it can steal his identity too. Ah, drat. So you can see why some people might have had some issues with this story. Now, right at the gate, it seems like I've got my work cut out for me if I want to try to explain any of this 
with real science. I mean, cloning? That's some Star Wars level science fiction right there. Artificially creating a complete and genetically identical copy of a living being using only one tiny, highly specialized part of their body? That is insane. Yeah, we did that. Let's talk about the real world science of cloning. The main way to create a real life clone is through a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT. And though the science and engineering that makes it possible is incredibly complicated, the theory behind it is actually quite simple. I'm sure you're all familiar with DNA the long molecule strings that determine everything about you. The color of your hair, your height, whether or not asparagus makes your pee smell a little funky, it's all determined by the precise order of molecules within your own personal DNA. So in order to create an identical clone of something, it needs to have the exact same DNA. DNA is stored within the nucleus of each and every one of your cells in structures known as chromosomes. Every cell has two chromosomes, one from your biological mother and one from your biological father. In order to create a clone though, we need both chromosomes to come from the same person. To do that, you're gonna need two ingredients. Ingredients, that is not a great word choice right there. It sounds like I'm reading a cookbook or something. Grandma's homemade cloning recipe. This recipe calls for two simple ingredients. The first is a somatic cell or body cell of the thing you're trying to clone. This could be a tissue cell, bone cell, blood cell, doesn't really matter, just so long as both sets of chromosomes are present. And the other thing you'll need is an egg cell from the same species as the thing you're trying to clone. To make your clone, start by removing the chromosome from the nucleus of the egg cell. Then, simply remove the chromosomes from your body cell and insert them back into the nucleus of the egg cell. Now that you have an egg cell with the genetic material of the creature you're hoping to clone, carefully insert it into a surrogate mother, let bake for 2-12 to 12 months depending on the species, and voila! You have a baby who is genetically identical to the original donor of the somatic cell. Bon appetit! Please don't eat it though. This may sound like some insane science fiction, but it's actually been done successfully in real life. The first and most famous example of cloning with mammals at least was Dolly the sheep. Dolly was cloned from a cell from the mammary gland of a Finn Dorset sheep in July of 1996. Researchers from the Roslyn Institute just outside of Edinburgh, Scotland were trying to test if it was possible to create a clone of a complex mammal using only a single specialized cell. And what they found was, yes! Since every one of your somatic cells, even highly specialized ones, contain chromosomes with your complete DNA, you can take a cell from basically any part of the body and grow an entire complete clone from it. And just to be clear, I know it sounds like some insane mad scientist type stuff when I spell it out like that, but there was actually a ton of research and planning prior to this experiment. They weren't just like, Hey, what if we did this crazy thing and see what happens? Dolly was born in 1996 and sure enough, studies revealed that she was genetically identical to the DNA donor. And what's more, she was basically just a regular sheep with no adverse side effects or health issues when she was born. It's basically just like if you had an identical twin that also happened to be born six years after you to a completely different mother. Totally not weird at all. Interestingly, Dolly was perhaps more identical to her donor than even the researchers expected. See, DNA takes the form of long strands, and these strands are capped with structures called telomeres, which are basically just there to protect your DNA from damage. As you age, these telomeres slowly break down and wear away. However, 
when researchers took a sample of Dolly's DNA a year after she was born, they found that her telomeres were far shorter than other lambs of her age. The theory is that because Dolly's DNA was taken from an adult cell and not a usual reproductive cell, her telomeres were not able to fully form and instead grew to the same size as her donor. So effectively, while Dolly was born as a regular baby, she was biologically the same age as her donor, despite being born six years later. Richard, I'm gonna need some aspirin or something. Now, thankfully, this didn't result in any adverse physical effects in Dolly. She still aged the same rate as a normal sheep. And in fact, for being the world's first mammalian clone, Dolly lived a very normal life, and she was even able to have six lambs of her own in the natural way. She eventually passed away in 2003 at the age of six and a half, as opposed to the usual 11 to 12 year lifespan of a Finn Dorset sheep after developing lung cancer. However, this is not believed to be a side effect of her birth, it's actually relatively common among this breed of sheep. Since then, we've successfully cloned 25 species of animals, including rats, fish, cats, dogs, even two types of monkeys, though never a human. Now, you might be thinking, as I was when researching all this, that's all well and good, but why the hell would anyone want to create a clone? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons. Having a large quantity of genetically identical animals can be handy for testing out medicine. It makes results a lot more consistent and easier to compare with fewer confounding variables. For all you animal lovers, don't worry, research suggests that this cloning process could be used to help increase the population of critically endangered species or even bring extinct animals back to life. There was an attempt to do this with an extinct breed of mountain goat called a Picardo, but the clone died shortly after birth because the DNA samples were too old and damaged. Now if you're thinking, hey, this whole thing kind of sounds like Jurassic Park or something, You'd be right! This is exactly what John Hammond was doing with those blood cells from the mosquitoes, which means, yes, Jurassic Park is, at least in theory, absolutely, scientifically, 100% possible. Maybe less than some better fences first, though. The other big area of interest with clones is in the creation and study of stem cells with identical genetic material to an individual. If a patient is in need of some critical organ transplant, say you need a new kidney, you can't just stick any old kidney in there. Because if the genetic material is too different from your own, your body will think it's some sort of invasive virus or infection and it'll start to attack it. That's why you'll often hear about family members donating organs to those in need because they have similar genetic makeup so there's less risk for a rejection. But with cloning, you don't need to let the original egg cell grow into a full creature. You could, at least in theory, just grow it into a kidney with your exact DNA and effectively become your own organ donor. Now we've covered a lot of ground here, so before we get too deep in the weeds, I do want to take a step back and zoom out and bring us back to reality. You're watching a video about Fazgu right now. So how does Fazgu hold up compared to this whole cloning business? Well, the fact that it's able to grow an entire clone identical to the original donor in every way using just a single tooth is actually spot on. This is exactly the sort of thing that the Dolly experiment proved was possible. Now it didn't have to be a tooth, it could have been, I mean pretty much anything else. You just need one single cell. And I'll be honest Mr. Little, it's a little weird that you made the kids rip out their teeth. Could have just hocked a loogie in there. Unfortunately though, that's where the similarities end. For starters, the process of extracting the DNA from the original cell is incredibly complicated, requiring microscopic pipettes and glass needles less than a tenth of a millimeter wide. Not some pink goop. Real clones also require a surrogate parent and the normal gestation period. 
they're born as regular babies, not the same age as the cloner. What do you call the, what do you call the thing that you've been cloned from? Like the clone is a clone of what? I don't, I genuinely don't know what the, what the like scientific name for that is. If anyone knows the real actual name, let me know in the comments. And lastly, and possibly most importantly, one of the major upsides of SCNT cloning is that the original donor is completely preserved in the process. You don't need to steal any of their organs or covertly replace them. The clone should have all the genetic material required to grow these organs themselves. In fact, one could argue that growing new organs is the whole point of making a clone in the first place. So all of these properties that can't be explained by real world cloning science must be some pseudoscience magical properties of the goo itself. So looking at all the ways FASGU is similar to SCNT cloning and the ways that it differs, I think we can get a pretty good idea of how exactly this stuff is supposed to work in universe. But I'm warning you, if you thought FASGU was bad before, it's about to get a whole lot worse. And I'll be honest, Richard and I, we've had our differences in the past, but even I wouldn't subject him to animating this, nor you to watching it. So, uh, I don't know, just throw up some sort of like landscape in the background, just some calming music for the next part. Yeah, I think, that's, I think it's good. You know what, in fact, get me off the screen. Get, get me down off the screen. I don't wanna be here. I don't want people looking at me when they're hearing about this stuff, all right? Ready? All right, brace yourself. We're about to, I'm about to hit you with some insane stuff. You ready? Fazgoo is a magical womb. Yup, in this setup, it seems that the pink Fazgoo is fulfilling the role of the surrogate mother. Contained within is an egg cell already stripped of its genetic material. Through some chemical process, the Fazgoo is able to extract the genetic material from the tooth, or literally any other part of your body, Mr. Little, ya freak. And once the DNA has been extracted, the egg cell is able to grow. The tendril that connects Chris to the goo is effectively an umbilical cord, providing nutrients to the growing clone. Now, typically, a human would take nine months to develop, and it would come out as a baby. But I suppose that's why it steals Chris's organs. It needs to speed up the process to grow into a fully grown teenager in a single night. And I just want to reiterate, this stuff apparently comes in a science kit sold by a fucking pizza restaurant. And there you have it. Faz Goo fully explained using real world science. <laughs> I've finally done it. I've covered every single bit of insane technology and science that Scott and his crew could cook up. I've done it all. The work is done. Finally, I am free from FNAF. What? No, no, what is that? What is that? No, no, no! That's not true. That's impossible. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alkazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby. This show would not be possible without your support, so thank you.